We've been looking at the last few weeks talking about but God. But God has a better idea. But God intervenes. But God knows better. One of the marks of our modern culture today is the belief that if one will just follow his own heart, follow our dreams, we'll be all right. Award-winning Christian author Stephen James comments in an interview with World Magazine, this was uh, done a few years ago, he said that some movies and books say life is just terrible now, you know, encourage you to slit your wrist. Well, how unchristian is that? And he goes on to say, Disney, on the other hand, has, has the theme, follow your dreams and everything will be wonderful in the end. He says that whole idea, Stephen says, the whole idea of following your heart, that's not Christian either. You see, when you look at it, rapists follow their hearts. Pedophiles are true to themselves. Nazi pursues their dreams. The Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things. We believe that you should follow something greater than your heart that you need. Someone else to inform your dreams, and we turn to God. It's a quote from Stephen James. That's a hard pill to follow, to swallow. Our hearts are deceitful and wicked. I didn't say that. God's Word says that. Over in Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 9 and 10, this is uh, the Lord speaking. He says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruits of his doing. You see, the fact of the matter is, and, and, and Randy read about it earlier from Psalms uh, 139, you know, talking about that God knows us. But God knows our hearts. God knows our hearts. He knows our every thought. And if you think about it, God knows everything that goes through my mind. And that's a scary thought in and of itself. My mind, my thoughts aren't always pure as they ought to be. God knows our every thoughts. And most people don't think about that. They fool and deceive the world around them, including themselves. And so subconsciously, many people think, why not God also? We find record of that in the scriptures. And today, if you would, turn with me to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, we're just going to be looking at two short verses this morning, and I'll, I'll fill you in on the context of these verses in a minute. But we're looking at verses 14 and 15, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Luke 16, beginning at 14. Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money also heard all these things, and they deriled him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we read from your word today, Lord, may we be more in tune with Jesus. May we have his, put his mind in ours. Lord, that we might love the things that you love, that, that the things that you hate, that we would hate. Lord, that we might understand the world and things around us as you see them. Not as man sees them, not as the culture sees them, but as you see them. Your word is true. And Lord, may we be set free by your truth. Be with us this morning. May the name of Jesus be lifted up in this place. For it's in his holy name we pray. Amen. A few years ago, uh, according to CBS News, two men, uh, their last names Allen and Warden, made a shocking discovery about their iPhones. 
I got an Android, by the way, about their iPhones. It seems that their iPhones have been gathering data and tracking their whereabouts wherever they go. The phone actually records various data points that are stored and used to trace the exact path a person takes, whether they are uh, of whoever they're in possession of. The data could reveal all sorts of activities that the person engages in during the course of a day. Security experts fear that the uncovering whereabouts of unsuspecting spouses may cause a number of divorces. Others fear about the violation of privacy. This is coming out of the CBS News source. Forget about Apple knowing about where you go. Fact is, God, only, God not only knows where you are, but he knows what you're doing. He even knows the intents of your heart. Hebrews 4 verse 13 says that there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. God knows it all. So why do we live our lives as if he doesn't? Think about that. Putting our focal passage into context, if you have your Bibles open, kind of scan chapter uh, 16 of Luke, and, and, and they're talking about money here and, and, and our use of money, and Jesus gives the parable of the unjust steward and how the steward used his master's money and his accounts for his advantage. Now, we're not talking about money today, but money is the, is the setting here. And finishing out the parable, at, at, at uh, verse 13, Jesus makes this statement. Luke 16, verse 13. Jesus says, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is just another word. Some of your translation may have wealth or may have money. It doesn't make any difference. It's serving the things of this world. As Christians, we're so, so supposed to have only one Lord and Master, and that is Jesus. But the problem is other things get in the way. If something gets between you and Jesus, you're serving it and not him. For the Pharisees, who were overhearing these teachings of Jesus, money was clearly their master. Look at verse 14. It says, now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money. It was very clear. The Pharisees knew all about money. They were hypocritical and they were proud. They chose religion as a lucrative profession. And there was no vow of poverty there. You know, I knew a few so-called evangelists on television today with their Rolexes and gold rings, and, you know, they didn't take a vow of poverty either. You know, it's all about what's in it for me. They were bringing about glory for themselves and not to God. Uh, Matthew records some of the words of Jesus. Matthew 23, verses 5 to 7. Jesus is, is talking about the Pharisees. You know, any, nowhere in the Bible does Jesus have a kind word about the Pharisees. And they were the religious know-it-alls and supposedly the religious followers of that day. He says, but all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad... According to Jewish law, you had to wear these little things on your forehead and wrapped on your arm. They're little leather bags that have pieces of scripture in them. They make them extra big so everybody can see them. Read about that over in Deuteronomy, by the way. He says they make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. You see, their garments had, had, had uh, tassels on the bottom of them. And, and they made their, ta you know, they're supposed to be prayer tassels. And they make theirs extra big so everybody can see them. He says, 
He says they make their phylacteries broad. They enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, the greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. They're all about what others saw in them. They believe their own righteousness to the point that they believe that their righteousness was such that God has blessed them with their wealth. More wealth and more money meant at least in their minds they were more right before God. You know, we touched on this uh, theme last week a little bit. Uh, and, and let me rever- uh, revisit one verse that we had last week. Psalms 49, verse 18. And it says, The while he lives, he blesses himself. This is talking about the Pharisees here. It says, For men will praise you when you do well for yourselves. Think about that. Don't people do that today? Folks that have done well, they make, they make the big bucks, they live in the big house, they drive the big cars, and people say, boy, you have made it, and they get congratulated by people. And the scriptures go and say, going back to verse 14, they said that they deriled him. You see, they had all of this money, and, and it's interesting looking at the words here. Other translations say that they sneered at Jesus. In the Greek, the word here means that they turned their nose up, is what the Greek word means literally. They turned their nose up. It is quite the sign of disrespect. They were probably saying among themselves, this poor itinerant teacher teaching his poor followers about money, What does he know? And they sneered at him. They deriled him. You see, some of the teachings, and you know these teachings, we read about them over in Matthew uh, uh, Matthew 6, you know, Jesus' uh, Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Jesus, uh, uh, Jesus talked about foregoing wealth on earth and lay up treasures in heaven. And that was a foreign concept to the to the Pharisees. To them, money was more real than the promises of God. To this, Jesus responded. Verse 15, it said he, that is Jesus, said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts, for what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Two significant things Jesus says here. Number one, God knows your hearts. The second thing, is that what we highly esteem, what we highly value, what is admired by men, is often an abomination, or some translations will have detestable or revolting in the eyes of God. You know, we we need to adjust our value system. What is valuable to God? What is worthwhile to Him? What is precious in His sight? It's not always what is precious in our sight. Jesus said, he said, you are those who justify yourselves before men. Too often, people will put on a show just for other people to see. And we have a word for that, and so does Jesus. He calls them hypocrites. That's an interesting word in the Greek. Hypocrites in the Greek means an actor. An actor who puts on a mask and pretend that there's someone else, someone other than themselves. The fact is, God sees through the mask. He sees just who we are underneath it all. Matthew 23, 27 to 28, he's talking to the Pharisees again and the scribes. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like white washed tombs which indeed appear beautiful outwardly but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness even so you also outwardly appear righteous to men but inside you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness the fact of the matter is what's on the outside What's on the outside does not matter to God. It's what's on the inside 
that matters to God. It is clearly what's on the inside. If the inside is clean and pure, the outside will reflect that, not the other way around. You can dress them up, but that doesn't mean that they're right on the inside. Mark 7, verses 20 to 23 Jesus says, and it says, he said, Jesus said, What comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetedness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. It's what's on the inside that defiles us before God. But you know, the fact is, people, and we've become quite talented in putting on a show for others. There are days I put on a mask, I won't deny that. You know, all smiles. But it's what's in the heart that really matters. It is what's in the heart. And so the question is, what is in your heart? What is in my heart? Why does it matter? Why does it matter? Because Jesus says, back in verse 15, but God knows your hearts. That's why it matters. He looks at the heart. It's a theme that we find throughout Scripture. It's it's about the condition of the heart. And let me bring up a couple of them. When Samuel, think about in the Old Testament, when Samuel went to anoint the next king after Saul, he went to the house of Jesse. And Jesse had all of these brothers that paraded in front of him. And God told him, uh, 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. What does God see? What does God see? David, and this was... uh, uh, Samuel ended up anointing David, and we know the story. Went on to slew Goliath and eventually became king. And when David was old and he was about to ready to hand over the reins of the kingdom to his son Solomon. And, and, and in context, he's talking about uh, erecting the temple. Because God said it wasn't for David to do because his hands were too bloody. He, he was telling Samuel, he was giving him some final instructions. 1 Samuel 16 verse 7. Uh, excuse me. Uh, 1 Chronicles 28 verse 9. 1 Chronicles 28 verse 9. This is David talking. He says, but as for you, my son Solomon, <coughs> know the God of your father and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all intents and thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will, for, he will cast you off forever. You see, if the heart is right, the actions will be right. Otherwise, it's only a show. We can only pretend. We must internalize the values and teachings of Scripture. That's how God speaks to us today. It's in His Word. To love God is to love His Word. We don't get to pick and choose what word we like and which word we dislike. We must accept the whole word or reject it all. You see, it's not what's right in our eyes. My opinion counts for counts for not you know God didn't ask me what I thought about things when he said what 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 is moral and right in his word it is right what it what's important is what is right and what is just in the eyes of God for he goes on to say in verse 15 he says for what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God it's not our sense of right and wrong that matters. What matters is right and wrong in the eyes of God. One day, I have to answer to him. Not to you, not to Ellen, 
not to the rest of the world. I have to answer to God for what I have done and for what I have failed to do and what the thoughts and intents of my heart is. I have to answer to Almighty God. It is, and, and that affects our eternity. Think about it. It is what, God, is what God has laid down as right and wrong that matters. The world around us has turning that upside down quite literally. I can't believe some of the things that they hold in high esteem anymore. What has been called good has now been called bad, and what is bad is now good. So much of the world admires what so much of the world admires and, and values is clearly an abomination before God. The prophet Isaiah nailed it 2,700 years ago when he prophesied, and you know these verses, Isaiah 5.20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. We're there. We are there. More literal than I have ever take, understood this verse, how literal this verse is. Those, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. There are so-called religious experts and authorities out there that will twist the Bible. We were talking about that this morning. There are those who will twist the words of Scripture to suit their purposes. And there are some that will even denounce the teachings of the Bible as being old and antiquated for a time gone past. I tell you what, the scripture is more relevant today than it has ever been. It is for us. It has been written for us. And scriptures, they'll denounce the teachings of scriptures or they'll twist the, the words of scripture to justify. I've seen clergy out there, <clears throat> so-called clergy, you know, uh, uh, given their blessings on abortion clinics. They'll justify abortion. <clears throat> They'll justify immorality, homosexuality, transgenderism, and just about any evil you want to imagine. They are slick speakers, and without the Holy Spirit being in us to help us discern these evils, we would be sucked up into them as well. Jesus spoke of these so-called religious people who pay him lip service, and they're out there. Mark 7, verses 6 to 7, He, that is Jesus, answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, hypocrites, as it is written, People honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines, the commandments of men, not the commandments of God, but what we think is right. What I think is right is meaningless. But what does the Bible teach us? Such fault worship, and we can read this in Scripture, is an abomination, is one of the abominations before God. And teaching as things of God, those things that are clearly taught, uh, they, they teach these things are against God's holy word. And... and and we have to go by God's word, not by what the culture says or does. So where is our hearts? Where is our hearts? Is it on air? Excuse me just a second here. <clears throat> Dry throat. Ah, thank you. Where's our hearts? Is it on the things of this world? Or is it on the things of God? So how do we know? What, what is it that we have to do? Romans 12, verse 2. Uh, uh, Paul writes, he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We only know what is good, right, and acceptable before God only if we're in his word and we're in constant communion with him in prayer and seeking him out. The more we transform our minds and our, our hearts will become more in line to God's way of thinking and not of our own. We are not to measure things the way that the world measures, but by the way God measures. By the way God measures. 
According to R.C. Sproul, uh, Sproul had a thing on the radio a few years ago. He died a couple years ago. Uh, quite the Bible teacher. Uh, he said, what is, uh, he made this statement in his commentary. He said, what God is looking for from his people is not success. Certainly not success in our definition of success. But fidelity. He doesn't measure us by our bank balance or the degree, degree of our authority. <clears throat> Maybe your task seems insignificant, what God has given you to do. It may seem insignificant, but God has given it to you and wants to see that you are faithful in it before he'll promote you to do anything else in his kingdom. God calls us to be faithful in all things. In fact, going back and back a few verses in Luke 16, uh, verse 10, he says, He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. So where do we stand? Randy read this morning, and, and uh, if time would have permitted, I would have loved to have read, read all of Psalms 139. Go back and read that. That talks about that God knows everything about us. But the last two verses that he read this morning, those last two verses is a quite a dangerous prayer. I have called it the most dangerous prayer in the Bible. Because look at what it says. Psalms 139, verses 23 to 24. We're going to go over that again. It says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of righteousness. Have you ever prayed that? Lord, show me what's wicked inside of me <laughs> because we won't like what we're shown. <laughs> you see, if our hearts are not right before God, we must ask him to show us where the evil lies and we have to ask him to clean our hearts. We can't clean it ourselves. We can't clean it ourselves and cleaning it won't be easy and it may be a painful process. But we cannot make ourselves presentable before God. We come and ask that Jesus repair our hearts by his shed blood on the cross, that our sins are wiped away and make our hearts right before God. It is a work of God, and it may be painful to see what's there. And as he shows it to you, we must confess, we must repent, we must put it away, and ask for God's strength to move forward. You see, oftentimes we go through all the motions. We do all the right things and we may look pious and we may look righteous to our friends and family and to the world around us. But God knows our hearts. Knows our hearts. Where is our heart this morning? Where is our true master? We can't serve both God and mammon. We serve one or the other. Where is our hearts? God knows our hearts. God knows our innermost thoughts. Are our hearts right before him? We're going to sing a hymn here in a moment. The Savior is waiting. God won't come in where he's not invited. You know, that's the one thing about uh, eternal torment and eternal life. He's given us a choice. And the vast majority of the world will choose the latter and not eternal life. What is our choice today? Where is our hearts, our hearts before him? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We come before you this morning. Uh, showing you our hearts and asking you to know our hearts, to show us the wicked way within us, that our hearts may be clean and pure before you. Lord, I, I'm, I know I spend my entire earthly life here in a constant cleansing process. The world wants to tear me away. The world tempts me away. But Lord, may we keep our eyes upon Jesus. 
And may our hearts remain pure before you. May you clean us today. Lord, I ask for your spirit to move us, move among us today. Lord, there may be someone here that's never had their hearts cleaned and that desperately wants to be pure in your sight. Lord, we ask that you touch them today. And Lord, that they'll come to a saving knowledge about Jesus. Lord, move among us, touch us. May we feel your presence and may Jesus be glorified. For it's in his holy name we pray. Amen.